Welcome back, fellow soldiers, to another edition of Appropriating the Culture. On the docket today, we'll continue with our analysis of the culture's conflation of victimhood with virtue, examine the lasting harm of championing victimhood, and provide a biblical basis for how to think of ourselves in light of trouble, persecution, and oppression. I'm Pastor Shane. I'll be your macro-aggressor today as we appropriate some culture. <laughs> So last week, we presented a slew of hate crime hoaxes, which was meant to highlight our culture's palpable desire for victim status. And the question is, why? Why does everyone seemingly want to be a victim? Why does everyone want to be oppressed? And the answer that we came to was because we've mistaken victimhood for virtue. We've looked through history and saw all these heroic people who were oppressed and wrongly concluded that those who were oppressed for their virtues were virtuous because they were oppressed. And through that lens, you can kind of understand the allure. If you're a victim, you're virtuous. If you're oppressed, you're noble. If you're afflicted, you're a good person. There's nothing wrong with wanting to be noble, but when victimhood becomes the ultimate virtue, that comes out in all manner of distasteful ways. In the extreme, you have hate crime hoaxes, but in more mundane ways, you have microaggressions, safe spaces, and trigger warnings. There's currency in being offended. Why? Because if you're offended, you've been wronged. If you've been wronged, you're a victim. And if you're a victim, you're virtuous. So the greater offended you are, the more virtuous you are, which is why you see so many people acting like a 19th century woman who's got the vapors. And it's also why I can't talk about gluttony without getting a warning from Facebook. I also can't talk about Pride Month or George Floyd. Apparently, it's offensive because everything is offensive to the most noble of our society, like patron St. Mark Zuckerberg. The more triggered you are, the greater your oppression, the greater your virtue. The more microaggress, the more victimized, and therefore more righteous. And if the world all around you is smotheringly oppressive, well, then naturally you'll need a safe space. They're like Superman with his fortress of solitude, and they're just as heroic. Actually, more heroic, because... Superman is nothing but a cisgender, normative, patriarchal, white male with a savior complex. That's offensive. See how easy it is to be virtuous if it's reduced to victimhood? And that sort of mindset has also led to the flourishing of one of the most poisonous ideologies in our culture, which is critical race theory. The entire construction of CRT is breaking down people into two categories, oppressors and the oppressed. And the deliberately ambiguous and nebulous notions of systemic or institutional racism is meant to obfuscate so that there will be perpetual victimization without a solution. It's presenting a problem that can never be solved. In fact, it can't even be defined. Ibram X. Kendi was asked to define racism. This is what he said. So racism, I would define it um, as a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. <laughs> sure, a, a collection uh, of racist policies that lead to racial inequity that are substantiated by racist ideas. Now, some people have called that a stupid definition, but that might be a bit uncharitable depending how you define stupid. If stupidity is a collection of stupid policies that lead to stupidity that is substantiated by stupid ideas, well, then they might have a point. You don't normally define words with the word that you're trying to define because that doesn't tell you the meaning of the word. But the lack of definition is the point. If racism is a problem that could be properly defined, it could be properly addressed. And then what would happen to our victimhood? See, it used to be that we could identify racists. Those are people who harbored animosity toward people of other races. But that's not the case anymore. You don't have to personally be racist to be a racial oppressor. And even in terms of systemic or institutional racism, we used to be able to clearly and concretely identify and label the structural racism. American slavery, racist. Jim Crow, racist. Segregation, racist. Redlining, racist. The systemic nature of that racism was very clear and tangible, and because it was identifiable, it was eradicated. We did away with those things. 
At present, the only institutionally racist policy codified into our system is affirmative action, which favors certain minorities at the expense of whites and Asians, and Jews if they count as whites. But when it comes to CRT, they don't actually identify any policy that is purportedly corrupting our system. It's a racism in the ether. It's a racism in the air that we breathe, a racism without clear definition because obfuscation is the point. If it could be identified, it could be addressed. But addressing it in any meaningful way would rob us of our victimhood. And so what we're left with is a nihilistic racism, a nebulous racism all around us but with no solution. And that has deleterious effects. We understand and have understood for a long time the harmful nature of victimhood when it comes to psychology. We'll use terms like rape survivor rather than victim because there's often a psychological benefit to doing that. Survivor implies that people are able to take control over their own lives, that they're fighting, that they're progressing. Victim is stagnant. Survivor is empowering. It's basic narrative therapy. It's changing the terms in which you think for your mental good. Being a perpetual victim is not mentally healthy, and when you start to view the world all around you as unstoppably oppressive, you relinquish your locus of control, which again is a psychological term that refers to the degree to which people believe that they have control over the outcome of events in their lives. And we have experiments on this. In 1971, there was a test on rats. The first rat was a control rat. It received no electrical shock. The second rat could avoid and escape the shock by pressing a lever. And a third rat was yoked to the second rat and couldn't escape or press a lever to avoid a shock. Because they were yoked, if the second rat got shocked, the third rat would also get shocked. So the second and third rat received the same amount of physical stressors. The only difference was one had control and the other didn't. Then they measured the stress level on these rats by looking at the level of ulceration. Here's the unsurprising result. The rat who was never shocked fared the best, and the rat who had no control fared the worst. If our agency is stripped away and we're just at the mercy of external forces, that has hugely harmful effects on our mental health. In pursuit of victimhood, we're creating a world in which we're uncontrollably being triggered, randomly shocked by microaggressions, and at the mercy of external forces. We're actually teaching people and convincing people that it doesn't matter what you do or don't do. It doesn't matter how hard you work or don't. It doesn't matter what choices you make. The sting of systemic racism will always keep you down. And there's no point of playing a rigged game. So what we're left with in our culture is a sort of nihilist racism. But speaking of rigged games, Appropriate in the Culture is brought to you by Systemic Three Card Monty. It's easy to find the solution to racism with Systemic Three Card Monty. Just fork over your money and keep your eye on the prize. Where's racial tranquility? There's racial tranquility. Just pick racial tranquility. There it is. Oh, shoot. Systemic Three Card Monty. No refunds. Alrighty, so what we've seen is that victimhood is not the virtue. The Bible, like we said last week, does not describe all suffering as being virtuous. And the perpetuation of victimhood through perceived oppression, particularly unrelenting and omnipresent oppression, is incredibly harmful. Now, we do recognize that life is filled with trials and struggles. People do sometimes face persecution, and in a fallen world, people are often wronged. But the person who was most wronged in all of human history was Jesus. Jesus was wronged, Jesus was betrayed, Jesus was savagely attacked and crucified, and his suffering and oppression was the least deserved. But Jesus was not a victim. He says this, The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. Jesus sacrificed his life. It wasn't taken from him. He takes up his cross willingly, and his followers are called to do the same. It says in Romans, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. We are sheep to be slaughtered. Well, that sounds like a victim. It sounds oppressed. Facing trouble, facing hardship, facing persecution, facing famine, facing danger, facing nakedness. That one sounds odd for him like that. It's not like, oh, nakedness, it's your lack of clothes. The point is, the Christian life is a life of suffering and trials and tribulations. 
Dear friends, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal that has come on you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. Fiery ordeals are a given in this world, and suffering and trials are a part of it. But does that mean we are victims? No! In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. The Christian is called to be like Christ, who suffered mightily but was not a victim. And through him, we have victory in every circumstance. So even though there are external forces against us, God enables us to live righteously. We can be good and holy and noble even in the face of persecution, which is commendable before God and is achieving for us a glory that far outweighs all of our troubles. The mindset of the Christian is victory, not victimhood. And that's really important for us to internalize as well because just like with the culture, we too can become despondent about the world where the darkness and sin of it all is oppressive and pervasive like systemic racism, and we can just easily be swallowed up in nihilism. But we are more than conquerors in Christ, and Christianity is about victory. Well, that's it for today. Uh, like, subscribe, rate, and review. If you like what we're doing here, share the link, tell a friend. You got to keep those reinforcements coming. And as always, if you have questions or comments or critiques, you can reach me on Twitter, Facebook, or Locals. And I'll see you next week, maybe. In the meantime, go appropriate some culture.